Good evening, everybody. I'd like to call the City Council uh, meeting tonight in order. If you can all please rise and join the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready? To begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Councilmember Carter, absent. Councilmember Davis, here. Councilmember Hepburn, here. Mayor Pro Tem Rosales, here. Mayor here. Here. We will go to item four, consent calendar. Yes, Mr. Mayor, um, I have to request that we pull item four F and bring that back as soon as we just have a conflict and we do not have a quorum in which to vote. It'll be on your next agenda. Okay. Is there a move to approve this? I'll move to approve the consent calendar minus four uh, F. Second. Oh, please. I can't hit my volume button. You can. <laughs> then register votes for a little bit. Okay, we'll move to items. Uh, five, and that is the uh, public hearing. Proposed Damien High School Master Plan update. Luke. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Laverne City Council. My name is Luke Seibert, senior planner here with the city of Laverne. The item before you tonight is, a, is the Damien High School Master Plan update. Um, the gentleman that I have to my left here, I'd like to introduce them, is Mike LaDuke, which is the project manager of Damien High School. Um, then we have Jeff Calvin with Calvin Architects. He'll be doing a bulk of the presentation tonight, especially going through the master plan itself, the three phases. And then we have Dio Glentis um, to my left here, who is the environmental consultant for LSA. Let me just go through a little bit of background here, and then we'll have the um, We'll have Jeff come up and give a presentation on the master plan. The process itself was kicked off in June of 2017. Uh, that, at that point, we then had a subsequent informational meeting with the neighborhood, and that took place on, in June of 2018. As a result of that, there was about 15 uh, members of the public that were at that meeting. Uh, there was really one chief concern that was raised. There was other ones that were able to uh, to work with the community on. This one in particular, we ended up putting as a condition of approval to um, and, uh, and before the city council for tonight, which um, revolves around the, uh, the fencing located along Damien and Palomaras. That fencing is, is by, by the community's concerns too high and then has too much landscaping, which creates some concern. So we're working on that uh, to address that. And that'll be a condition, that's a condition of approval, which is condition number two. Uh, for, on, on the uh, for the resolution. In addition to that, there was an environmental review for public comment, and that pu public comment period was from February 22nd to March 25th. At the conclusion of that, there were two comments that were received. One was from uh, Caltrans and one was from LA County. We've addressed those in, the, those comments have been addressed in the um, MND, which is on the dais for consideration tonight. In addition to public hearings, we have um, received recommendation for approval by, by DRC. That took place on April 2nd. And there was also a recommendation for approval by Planning Commission, which recently took place on April 10th. With that, I'd like to have Jeff Calvin come up and give a presentation on the uh, Damien High School Master Plan. Thank you, Luke. Mr. Mayor, uh, Council Members, I'm Jeff Calvin. We're the architects for Damien High School. Uh, as soon as the slides are up. And, um, Damien High School is at the end of Damien uh, Avenue and Bonita. Uh, I assume everyone knows where Damien High School is. Uh, it's a terrific school, academically and athletically. 
but like most schools these days, it needs to be modernized and have facilities added to it so it can really approach 21st century education in a good, prominent, aggressive way. So part of the program here is to add <coughs> science, technology, and engineering classrooms. And when we add those classrooms and we free up space in the existing buildings for your other core teachers to have their own classrooms, right now, a lot of the teachers don't have dedicated classrooms. So the school, as good as it is, needs more facilities so the teachers can have their own dedicated classrooms than they have all these new 21st century, 21st century classrooms as well. Also, you know the campus, the chapel has always been just a classroom with a label on it. So now we're going to give them a chapel. Also, the campus has circulation issues of students, faculty, and guests crisscrossing with automobiles all day long. And that's one of the issues we want to solve, as well as giving a great sense of place. So with that, uh, this is the existing campus in Ariel. This is Damien Avenue. This is Bonita. This is the original 1920s quad, the historic uh, center of the campus. The master plan is not going to demolish any buildings. What we will demolish is the shade structure that's used for dining, and there's a temporary trailer there that's been used for food uh, preparation for a long time. That's the only thing we're removing on the campus to make the master plan work. <coughs> Circulation, as I mentioned before, is a major issue. Cars come and go all day long through these park lots, <coughs> and the students walk from the quad and these classrooms down to the gymnasium all day long as well, walking, having to walk through the drive aisles. And so we want to get it to be a much safer campus. And so this is the master plan. So go back one, the existing, this is the master plan. So what, we, what we're doing is we're going to remove, I'm sorry, go back. We're going to build with our tennis courts now, Tennis is a very expensive use of land for a school. You only have a couple of students on there at a time, and it's much more valuable for uh, building locations. And Damien's tennis team is graduating this year. So <laughs> they don't need the tennis uh, We're also going to be building uh, with his and new ones here. So this is the master plan. Uh, we are going to be bringing all the parking lots up to uh, Laverne criteria, where you have eight spots and you have five feet of landscaping. You have five feet of landscaping against the perimeter as well. So we're going to bring all the landscaping and parking lot up to code. We're also going to take and create a new secured entranceway, so it becomes a secured campus with a real guard post. And we're going to have a what we call grand promenades that ties the campus together. So if you start at the heroic archway that faces Bonita from the old original high school, that access goes through the senior garden and it comes right down through the new uh, grand promenade to a culmination at the gymnasium building. So this is the master plan in architectural drawings. Bonita's at the top of the page. This is Damien. And the way we make all this work, the way we get this walkway in is that we remove the parking spaces and we put a new 134th space parking lot down here. We take out a, uh, a, a baseball infield that's not needed for practice anymore and that gives us the space to put these cars. So right now there are 415 parking spaces on campus. At the end of the math plan will be 420. Okay, the master plan includes a new di uh, dining center, which is called the student center, that replaces the one that we're demolishing. It has a classroom building here, the chapel and science building. Then we have engineering technology buildings around this quad. We have a new quad at this location for engineering as well, for sciences, I'm sorry. We have a uh, student store, and we have a snack bar. Uh, a band classroom and its support, 
and we have a wrestling room. We also have a 400 seat auditorium to be the last phase of the master plan. Okay, this is the existing and phase one. The phase is always gonna be shown in blue and green. So in phase one, we reworked the parking lot on the northwest corner of the campus. We then have the new dining facility and the new wrestling room. That's part of phase one. Phase two, which is the crux of the master plan, uh, puts in this parking lot. Once that parking lot is in, we can then demolish this parking area and create the grand promenade that ties the campus together. And we have the classroom building, the science chapel building, and then the engineering technology buildings around this quad, and the student store, the snack bar, and the uh, band room. <laughs> Phase three is just a 400 seat performing arts center that also includes classrooms to help support, support our performing arts. That very quickly is the master plan. This is some views when you, when you come driving in, if I go back a second, when you drive in here, you're gonna see the chapel. This is the view of the chapel as you drive in. So now Damien High School has a cha chapel that's prominent and it focuses everybody on the campus. This is the Grand Promenade looking from north to south. This is the existing gymnasium. This is the chapel and the science classrooms behind it. And this is the view of the student center, which is a new dining hall, but it's also where students can gather uh, and parents can gather and they can use it for all kinds of events. And we pick up on the arches that are along Bonita to create the facade on this building that faces the historic senior garden. Okay, so now we have an animation to show you. It's very quick, it's only about a minute. I'm gonna to have to talk very quickly to walk you through it. <coughs> Okay, so again, at the top is Bonita, this is Damien. We're going to start and come down Damien and go in the new entrance way. This is the guard shack, secure campus. This is the chapel, and the entrance drive. A quick look into the chapel. The chapel sees 120 students. The gathering spot outside the chapel, there's a gymnasium. Here is the senior garden, and this is the dining facility. So the windows focus out on, on the beautiful quad. That we go through, this is existing 200 building, historic building, has this walkway all the way there, and that brings you right on access with the, the gym. This is one side of science building, it's symmetrical. You enter on both the north and the south side the same way. And then this is the technology uh, and engineering quad. This is the student store at this location. And we have gathering areas for the students at the end for everyday gathering here. And then this is a safe central promenade that ties the whole campus together. Thank you. So I just want to finish with staff's recommendation and uh, staff, the Planning Commission, and the DRC recommend approval of resolution, which is 19-22, before the City Council tonight. It does two things. It finds in light of the whole record the project will not have a significant effect on the environment and adopt the MND the mitigated negative declaration, which is exhibit one to the resolution, and adopt conditional use permit number 61-17 CUP for the proposed Damien High School master plan update, which is exhibit two to the resolution. And I would just preface it with the, the drawings that you're seeing here, the perspectives that you're seeing here are preliminary. They will have to go through as a part of the conditions of approval, um, development review committee um, review and approval at a later date.
when will all this be done? It's a 10 year master plan. So that be, by the end of 10 years, everything will be built. As long as funding is there. As long as funding is there. So another technical question. Um, it looks like the, the requirement is 575 parking spaces. Is there a mitigation plan or was that just, it, was there something to address that? Or was that requirement just waived or how, did, how was that addressed? Excellent question. So the original master plan had a variance. That variance allowed for several several pieces to the puzzle. One was a reduction in the in the number of parking spaces that were required. The other was a requirement for um, permitted parking, and then obviously the parking that you see along Damien High School or Damien Avenue is not allowed for the students. So thank you. Yep. They will only issue up to so many permits. 274, really it's, it's dedicated for the seniors. Okay. Freshman Mill Drive. Mm -hmm. Okay, is there any questions of Loop or any of the, at this point? Okay, um, this is a public hearing, so anybody that would like to, uh, that we're gonna open right now, anybody that would like to address this master plan, Please come forward. Um, fill out a green card either before or blue card before or after. Identify yourself. We'd like to put it in the record. So anybody that would like to address this, please come forward. Sherry Best, Laverne Historical Society President. Uh, I'm very happy to hear that the uh, the original. Uh, building in the front is being preserved but there is also a, a like a fresco like painting that's on the wall can you can you give us a little more insight about that thank you that, that building is that, that, that building is preserved that, 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 that is preserved perfect thank you thank you sure thank you. anybody else would like to address this issue Okay, we will bring it back here. Um, Charlie, you want to start off with comments? Uh, the Indian is probably one of the premier learning centers in the state of California. Every year we are <clears throat> privileged to have young men come up here and stand with us, sit with us, and take our spot for the day or for a, for a period of time. And most of the young men that I've met are extraordinary young people with high goals and high achievement. And I think anything that Damien does to for to bring that bring that to the front is something that I agree with. I, I it's a grand old campus. I mean it's been around since 1920, so it's almost hundred years old. Was the campus built in 1905? I thought that was okay. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's been there a long time. <laughs> I wasn't here in 19. <laughs> My grandfather was, but I was. Um, anyway, I think it's a great move. I think that that uh, building on what um, Councilmember Rosales said, that I think that the that Laverne is, is fortunate to have an outstanding educational school such as Damien. I think Damien does well to have Benita, and Benita does well. To have Damien. I, rec I, I correlate the two to, I went to school at UC Berkeley and our, our tribal was Stanford, two of the finest Pac-12 institutions in, in the country. And uh, I think Damien and Benita are fine institutions. So I, I'm glad you're keeping up. Good job. I'm pretty much gonna reiterate what everybody else said. I think that uh, we have some great higher learning centers here along with the university and it just adds to the mix of why people wanna come to Laverne and live because we have wonderful schools, we've got great places to see, we've got great places to live, and uh, uh, Damien's just another one of those. It's nice to see that they're keeping the historical aspect of the school intact, but making it flow much better, because it it's been there a long time, and it definitely needs some uh, sprucing up, I should say, so I really appreciate what you guys have done, and also staff, that uh, <coughs> it will be a much better place, as long as they can, they'll work hard to get that funding secured so they can get phase one going and hopefully phase two right after that so thank you I only corrected council member Davis because I have a picture in my office that's dated 1905 that has the original 
Bonita High School building in, so that has been a high school for going on 115 years. It was the field that was in those pictures that Glenn Davis ran when he was in high school and set some amazing records. Um, I am thrilled to see the modernization, but keeping in perspective the arches and things that so many of us have seen for decades as we drive by and visit the campus. This is absolutely spectacular. Somebody has some great vision. And, and I know as uh, community leaders that we appreciate all the effort by both all of you um, and um, Damien High School and the Archdiocese of LA for this commitment to education for some amazing young people that we've had a chance to talk to for years. And I'd like to also compliment Luke for a job well done. Appreciate every all the work that you've done with so on that. Um, and with that, I would entertain a motion to adopt conditional use permit 6117 at uh, CUP and resolution number 19-22. Is that? So move or much rest of it. Oh, please. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you very much. <coughs> Then you tell them, Luke, that they have to stay. <laughs> Bear witness to the whole meeting. Thank you very much. Okay, we will move to item 5B, uh, annual adjustments to the city comprehensive fee schedule. Mr. Uh, Mayor, uh, Finance Manager Nathan Statham will give the report. Uh, essentially, uh, every year as part of the budget process, we evaluate our fees that we charge for services and other uh, charges and uh, bring them up to what our direct costs are. And I think Nathan will be able to. Oh, there he is. It's in the back there um, to kind of go through the details. But this is, uh, as you mentioned, the annual review that we do for the charges. Mayor, council members, um, well, Bob kind of covered a good portion of uh, what I was going to lead in with. So um, <clears throat> there were only a few changes. So I, what I'll do is I'll just run through the basics of the changes and then take any questions and try to answer as best I can. Um, the first, the first fee that were that was implemented was the over-the-counter planning approvals, and there were several fees in this category. Um, this basically staff time was being spent. This was evaluated in the past um, in relation to the fiscal sustainability plan. It was being spent and not recaptured, so these fees um, allowed the recapture of those costs. And again, as part of the, the plan that was implemented. The second, the second new added item is the deposit for the small cell design review. It <coughs> was treated as a deposit, which basically will allow the city to charge for time and if materials are involved materials. So it puts it in as a deposit and just allows charges for that initial deposit of $500 and then um, cost of career for that. There were a few that were not new but updates. Um, the first one here under updates is the entertainment permit fee. This was implemented last year as a new fee and just when we when we did the wording on that we didn't put it as an initial year and then a annual renewal we just called it annual renewal created some confusion especially since there was like a six month um window between when it was considered the is built annually but there's some time in between so anyway it became kind of confusing so simply clarifies that same fee no change to the actual fee itself um classification of use this uh fee was it was already a 300 dollars fee However, the $300 was not actually um, representative of necessarily the time being spent uh, to evaluate these particular plans. Um, so what, what it does is just turns it into a deposit, so it'll be actually built for the time and if materials are involved, materials used to, to do this. The next one down is the solar collectors, and this is for residential solar collector fees. Not the commercial is, has not changed. This was because there was a state mandate that actually precluded these fees. Um, we did evaluate this. It's a neg having a negligible effect in what we've actually been collecting versus what we will not be collecting now. But it does have to come off because it conflicts with the state mandate. Um, fence review fee. This was simply reevaluated and it was increased by five dollars because of just the staff time involved in um, in the actual process. The large category um, after that is the refuse and recycling fees. 
these are these are just set consistent with the waste management contract. Um, it was based on CPI. It was a 3.81 percent increase across the board for all the fees. Um, this does presume that the contract goes forward. I know that this is subject to some negotiations currently, so that that is that's that presumption. But we just increase the fees accordingly for right now. Um, the one thing that was added that is a little bit different is the commercial, the chart of commercial um, refuse fees. What added to the fee schedule? These are consistent with the previous fees. Simply, they were not included in our in our fee schedule, and it was brought up uh, by the assistant city manager that we should probably actually approve these fees that are being, even though they're being built by waste management. So we did include this in our fee schedule, um, mm -hmm. and that was that's the gist of the fees. Not that much, not that much many changes overall. Any questions on the specifics of that? Okay. Thank you, David. If I may clarify, just one correction. Um, actually, the fees for waste management that are included here are part of their existing contract. So they, regardless of whether we negotiate an extension or not, these will apply because our contract is due next year. Just because of the cost. So it's just the normal. Good. Okay, this is a public hearing. So if there's anybody who would like to address this item, please come forward. Okay, we will close the public hearing. Bring it back, Chen. Um, I know waste is probably not one of the neatest things to talk about, but uh, there's been major changes in waste hauling now and also with, with recycling. So I know Cal Recycle is changing the one where you go to the units and you can put your bottles and cans. But also, I, if I'm not mistaken, China cut off the trash that you could send to them, the recycle you could send to them. So it's changed the dynamic. So Unfortunately, I think that we're in for, uh, as, as residents, we need to be a lot more wise about how we recycle, how we separate. We did visit waste management, uh, Council Member Davis and myself, and then we also visit, visited Athens, and it's called a MERF. It's a multi-use recycle facility where they separate. It's amazing. It's really amazing, but it's amazing to see what's down there and what and how they separate and silt and, and uh, the big problem right now is what we found out this last week was that uh, cardboard and paper, which used to be cardboard uh, $120 a ton, is now like 60 or 70 And paper is just off the charts worth nothing. So these facilities would bring in your recyclables and then they would sell it off and that's how they would make money on the recycling. But that's going to change the dynamic. So guess what happens? We all have to, uh, we're, we're going to bear the brunt of it a bit. But anyway, just as a note, um, we need to be more wise, think before you toss, make sure that you separate your trash, make sure plastic bags are empty, not full of stuff, and just a little lesson here on trash, but uh, um, as far as the fees, it's a cost of living, it's not a big deal, but uh, just a little information. Thank you. Here. I, I, I think uh, Council Member had from covered it well, so I've got nothing to add. <laughs> It was covered. <laughs> it's not a subject you want to revisit. Be separated over and over, and over, and over again. <laughs> uh, a little bit more about recycling. We are mandated right now as a city to recycle approximately 50% or more. That's, and that's a demand, and that can be your lawn trimmings. It can be so green waste. You know, going to uh, Bracket Airport every December and turn in you know your batteries and your oil and paint, things like that all get added into it. It's collected by the sanitation district for the county of Los Angeles. But it's going to 75% um, relatively soon, so we really have to be conscious of what we do with our recycling. Um, not just um, a little bit, but if you have neighbors that aren't doing it, please have a conversation with them and encourage them to help with this process. So. With that, we'll I'll entertain a motion on 5B on the comprehensive piece. Of motion to approve. Second. Oh, please. Thank you. I do want to make one comment. Lee, do you see? She's here from Waste Management. The people who enter Athens in Waste Management, Waste Management was last week, they're absolutely, if you can, any resident can go and set up a, 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 a view and visit of their facilities to see how it actually functions. They were wonderful, both both facility Athens and, and waste management. Very friendly, take you through the process. It's it's really interesting, but it also makes you cognizant of the fact that we need to do better. But 
you can call waste management or Athens and waste management being our carrier, just call them. You should call City Hall and we can see them. Yeah, they can, and they'll set you up with a tour. So. And, and on, I guess on top of that, what the lesson I learned is that you really want to think before you bring the things home to your house and then you have to sort them into the can. So to the extent that you can prevent all the packaging, that the, so much the better. Reduce, reuse, recycle. Recycle is number three. Thank Just you saying. Okay, we will move to item six under other matters, and we have um, authorization of consulting service agreement uh, with um, GBWB Strategies and True North Research. Yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you. I will handle this item. Um, this is a follow-up um, to the study session that the council had in, on February 4th. Um, if you remember at that time, we had some preliminary discussion about the pursuit of a tax measure as part of the March 2020 election. Um, at that time, you directed staff to take on several efforts. One was to do some educational forums that uh, Mr. Mayor, you and uh, Davis uh, attended to just help some of the community understand that we're interested in what some of the issues were that we were facing and the need for the tax measure. Um, and in addition to that, the council directed us to explore engaging the consultants, uh, one as a communication consultant, and the second um, as a polling strategist, um, which is True North and TBWP, um, which are the consultants that we have utilized in the past. We had explored other um, consultants in this field that have been used by other agencies and after reviewing just their, their overall um, work, we felt that, that the use of these two were the best. They served us well the last several times that they've been used and we didn't see any reason to recommend a change. Um, they have been uh, at least an initial interview with the finance subcommittee um, and then that was their recommendation, your recommendation to bring these two forward. Um, it does warrant a appropriation of $75,000. Um, that's for the two contracts. Um, the communications consultant will be engaged to do some of the, um, the information, not only in a hard copy, but on a web and in the social media realm. And then the uh, pollster, True North, will be used to do the actual polling, which should take place sometime in the midsummer. Um, after which council will be left with the information to determine whether to move forward with this in the March election. So um, what I'm asking for is uh, your direction and approval of these agreements and the appropriation uh, for that as well. Any questions? Okay. Um, We're going to open this up for anybody that would like to address this item. Uh, Please feel free to come up to the podium. Good evening, Council, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Rick Bowen. Um, in 2016, the city spent over $60,000 for this uh, same group, which is, I'll identify later, I call it a marketing group. Uh, TBWB and basically it says how to sell a new safety tax to Laverne citizens. In November 16 I stood before the council holding a very nice slick brochure <coughs> produced to suggest a new um, safety sales tax of I believe at that time 1% because it was needed immediately to keep our city safe After numerous citizens uh, protested and the city manager acknowledged that new state propositions would add six to nine hundred thousand uh, dollars to the Laverne General Fund to maintain parks and roads so that the new tax would be basically shelved for future consideration. <clears throat> well, apparently the future is here. Uh, we're still paying for all these propositions, probably more. Uh, at the same time, the city paid for a $60,000, more than $60,000 um, outside company for a compensation study. That was just released last week, almost two years later. And by the way, anybody that's interested, here's how you get a copy from the city. You have to glue all the pages 
pages to together to figure it out. <clears throat> um, at the same time, now you're back to what I call a citizen trough uh, to try to get us to pay more money for the same exact company at a minimum of $75,000. And I think that's somewhat disingenuous when you look at the contract. So it has uh, $26,000 more and 11000 more and other consultants. So I believe the, the 75000 stated is, is, again, the absolute minimum. Again, to market a new sales tax. That's what they do. That all sounds gr great, but that was 2016. Yet, during the last, that time period, two and a half years, the city allowed the firefighters to be treated so poorly by their own chief, the city manager, the city attorney, and the city personnel offer, officer, that they filed and won a $5.5 million federal lawsuit. That's not the topic that we're on. Yes, it is, actually. No, it's not. We're talking about the uh, hiring of two companies to do. And that's my point. That's, well, so you go back to, right. sure, you go back to the safety issue. You don't pay for other things. You want to guide, you want to market it under the guise of a safety issue. And again, <coughs> anybody that's interested can read what, <coughs> why the city manager wants to do this. You need more money for the general fund. You're running a deficit and you want to continue hiring outside consultants. This is not needed. You want to go back to the same person that you've paid before. You have the old study. I would suggest you re-look at the old study prior to spending probably upwards of $125,000, $140,000 just to come back to market a safety tax. So I ask for you not to go forward this with this. I ask for you to not spend more money that the city doesn't have. I just sat through a study session on the budget, and the city's still running at a deficit. So don't spend money we don't have. Let's look at other ways to do things. Where's the cost cutting? Where's other things that are going on? <coughs> Thank you. Anybody else like to address this issue? <coughs> okay, we'll bring it back here. Tim, would you like to start? Yes. <coughs> um, after much thought on this revenue measure and raising our sales tax to supplement our general fund, I've come to the conclusion. I've supported this knowing that the current general fund cannot support the future increase in cost around this city and keep our services at present intact. The recent 5.5 million payout pay to the firefighters and the ancillary cost of the LSA settlement of $350,000 plus, the cost of our attorneys and the JPI attorneys in excess of hundreds of thousands of dollars. This is just a very conservative estimate on the real cost of this lawsuit. We will have a major increase in our insurance rates as the JPI has spent a lot of money defending the city. I cannot support this consultant nor the tax measure. I feel that our city attorney has not counseled us directly to stay out of lawsuits like these, and also the city manager for not having an open and candid discussion with the firefighters. He needed to really listen to the issues with the voter no confidence against their chief and later with the PC and make difficult, tough decisions to make the necessary removals and changes to stop the lawsuit. The process about open lines of communication with all employee groups needs to be done at all times. We need to always have candid and open discussions with management and the employees to address any issues before they turn into lawsuits or employee unrest and no trust issues. Until these items are addressed and we get our financial house in order, I will not support this measure. Mr. Hepburn, I don't know 
why we have to go down this road time and again with you. If you're not accurate, your portrayal of the city managers, repeated attempts to get the fire department to talk, they changed appointments when they had the opportunity to talk, they refused to talk and have Chief Jankowski there, and you know that. You know that the city manager has time and again made every effort to talk with the fire department to try and work out this situation before it became a, a, a matter for the courts. And I just wish you would do the, the city a favor, do the city council a favor, and be accurate in what you say. Now, as far as the consultants that were used for the purpose of raising the sales tax, I, I'm, I'm hoping you understand that they'll be able to put this together in a package that everyone will be able to look at and understand. I was at, I happened to be at four briefings for the fire, for the police department this last week. On two occasions, while they were in briefing, they got two calls that took all the manpower. Now, I don't know if some of you don't realize some of the propositions that have gone through at Sacramento, but they're releasing felons by, by the thousands onto the street. <coughs> I don't know if you looked at the southern border, but our border patrol can't handle the influx of immigrants into this country. You have to understand that the cost of doing business <coughs> and keeping Laverne, Laverne is going to require vast amounts of money. And I hope you understand that we're trying to do what is the best for the city in the protection of the lives of the I think that this consulting arrangement is necessary and important. I think it builds off of what we had done last year in our financial sustainability um, planning. I think the city is being run very prudently and efficiently. I don't think that there's more money in any well that's going to help us maintain our <coughs> public safety organizations and employee groups. Um, so I think we need to go to a tax measure. I think that in some people <coughs> say the writing's already on the wall because if, if we don't raise this tax measure, the county will. And so our residents will be paying it regardless of whether we issue this tax measure or not. I'm not so sure that people understand that. So I think we need the help that we need to be able to get the message out and make sure that everybody moves forward for this tax measure in a knowledgeable and informed way. It frustrates me when people cherry pick certain parts of information to try to frame a discussion that I, I believe it's all very simple. We had, a, we had a, a, a sustainability plan. That plan's been engaged. It saved us so far over $25 million. But we need more. We need more help. We need to do something on the revenue side. So I'm in favor of these consultants and this measure. As Muir said, there's just about every city around us are, is going to the maximum state mandated maximum of ten and a quarter percent we're at nine and a half percent and the reason is is because they want the money in the city instead of the money going to the county so if it goes to the county will we get any of it sure in small pieces but if we pass a measure then we get it all not somebody else so that's one of the reasons that we're going for the three quarters of a cent in sales tax. Every time that we have done this, starting in the early 90s, we have hired a consultant, and it's this consultant for the most part, for two reasons. One, to find out if it's feasible and one to contact residents to get their input to see if it is something they would like to do if it comes back <coughs> not favorable we won't do it if it comes back favorable we will do it and we've been very successful the residents of laverne have stepped up and said 
we want the services that we have now, and we are willing to pay for them. California is an expensive state to live in. We all know people that are moving out of the state. Laverne is not is not an expensive place. It is is an expensive place, just like all the other communities around. <coughs> When we did this before a few years ago, it wasn't because of resident protests that this got shelved. It was because right after Measure M and Measure A were passed unexpectedly by the residents of the county, I came before you in front of this mic and said, I am proposing that we do not move forward on this tax measure because we had received income from Measure M Measure A that was going to be in the 650 to 700,000 range. The quarter cent sales tax that we were proposing was going to net about a million dollars. So there was a little bit of a shortfall, but not a lot. It wasn't a 1%, it was a quarter of a percent. And on this one, when we started talking about this, Mr. Bowen, who just got up and criticized this whole thing, wanted to be in charge of it because he knows how important it is for this community. Because he's lived here a long time and understands the value of living in Laverne and understands also that it's not a cheap place to live. So we're doing nothing different than we've done in the past. Last thing I would like to say, and this has bothered me for a long time, but after you brought up Council Member Hepburn of all the lawsuits and so forth, you realize that all these lawsuits didn't start until after you were elected. Oh, oh my God, are you kidding? That's horrible. Unbelievable. That's horrible. That is defamation. I hope you have the minutes. I'm just yeah, saying. That needs to be in the that's low. Yeah. That's enough. No, that's no, no, it's not. Enough. That was enough. That was not enough. Cut the order. Okay, please. I don't want to be part of this city anymore. You guys are a joke. So I am in favor of this consultant, just like the, the success that we've seen in the past. I that, I'd entertain a motion. I need to talk. Uh, you're excusing me. I don't. First of all, Mr. Rosales, I appreciate your comments, although not true. The only thing that's not true or not accurate is how much it's actually is going to cost the city. I'm thinking a million bucks out of general fund. And that's one of the reasons why. Uh, and for my election, um, this all happened after the election was over because of the fact that the firefighters were being mistreated by management. So um, I don't know how that correlates with my fault. So uh, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, but you're wrong. It had to do with you and the city trying to fight with the firefighters. And all we needed to do is have a small discussion and sit down with our employee group, and this would have been resolved. And that is simply not true, Mr. Head. That is true. No, it's not. Well, and I have the emails to prove it. We have Sorry. the depositions. Yeah. I've got the emails. Mm -hmm. I'll rest on that. Nice. Okay. Motion, please. I move that we approve resolution number 1924. Second. Roll, please. Okay, we'll move to item seven, public comment. If there's any one speaker for I got a little here. Item not on the agenda, please um, come forward. Sherry Best. Well, I have much less exciting things to talk about. You have I always seem to have not such exciting things to talk about. Uh, I'm Sherry Best, I'm the president of the Laverne Historical Society. And I wanted to announce several activities that we are sponsoring in May and June. Uh, the first is a tour of David and Margaret Youth and Family Services on Saturday, May the 18th. I'll place flyers on the table for interested folks. David and Margaret is a real proud part of Laverne's history, and this tour will give us an opportunity uh, to learn more about this institution that was initiated years ago. Uh, by Henry Coons uh, and has cared for 
children who are orphans, half orphans, and uh, who are uh, wards of the state. So it's, it's a very interesting place to visit, and I would urge you to take advantage of this tour that we're sponsoring. On Saturday, the 1st of June, uh, we are going to be going to Redlands to, uh, for the day. We're going to tour the Kimberly Crest House and Gardens in Redlands and the Lincoln Museum and the A.K. Smiley Library. Now, who knew that the Lincoln Museum in Redlands is the largest museum related to Lincoln memorabilia west of the Mississippi? I had no idea. Why is it in Redlands? We'll find out. So uh, the tour is on the 1st of June. We'll have transportation there, uh, courtesy of LA County Supervisor Catherine Barger. It'll be a wonderful day trip, and I urge you to uh, to take advantage of this tour. Cost, Sherry. Pardon me. Cost. Forty dollars. This is this is our one yearly fundraiser, so it will cover your registration. It covers entrance into the Kimberly Crest. House and Gardens in a catered box lunch. Box lunch. So um, the other is no cost, the trip to David and Margaret. And then finally, on the 10th of June, the Historical Society will conduct its summer member and community meeting at the Hillcrest Meeting House. This is also free of charge. And this will be an opportunity to learn about creating oral histories from our presenter and also a chance to take a look at the Gallery of the Laverne installation. This is our second annual uh, gallery event that we put on about the story of Laverne. We will, by the time we have our event on the 10th, we will have presented to over 500 third graders, the entire Benita Unified School District third grade. And also this year we included Holy Name of Mary School, come through the gallery and they learn about the history of their city through uh, docents who are either living at Hillcrest or other community members who talk to them about uh, important themes in the city. So that will be a lot of fun. We will begin at 6.30. We'll have an opportunity for a presentation, and then we will meet the artist of a new installation at the gallery that's called Gabriel's View. It's a beautiful photographic installation and a wonderful opportunity to meet your uh, uh, meet members of your community and find out about the history of Laverne. So I urge your attendance and thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Sherry. Mm -hmm. And thank you for doing a great job. Thank you. Okay, next is Tammy uh, Rausch. Tammy, there you are. Good evening, Council Members. This is Tammy Rausch. Council Members, Mr. Mayor, City Manager. My name is Tammy Rausch. I'm the Director of Engagement for Fairplex. Uh, good evening, residents. I have a couple updates for you. Um, I brought for each of you tonight the annual report for 2018, which we just completed for Fairplex as well as the Learning Center. Um, also, a couple additional updates for uh, you as well as all residents. Mark your calendars for Friday the 6th of September, which will be Laverne Day at the LA County Fair. Uh, once again this year, tickets for residents will be a dollar. So please watch your mailboxes. We will be doing an every door direct mailing to every resident within the city. You will need the instructions on how to get your, um, your discount on that mailing. So please make sure you have it. And if you have a neighbor, make sure that they got theirs as well. We're looking forward to seeing everyone from the city of Laverne at the fair that day. Uh, the theme for the fair this year is pop culture. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance to see the website, we're looking forward to bringing some really fun and exciting pieces. I will give you a sneak peek of something that hasn't been announced today that I'm very excited about. We're going to do a Girl Scout takeover day at the fair the second weekend. So can you imagine? <laughs> so we've got a lot of really fun things that are planned this year. Uh, I also left flyers over on the table there for a community update that we're hosting at the Sheraton Hotel next Tuesday night. This will be an overview of our, um, our year in 2018, an update on our strategic plan. We also are offering for anyone that comes to that meeting a $5 voucher for our food trucks that will be good the following Thursday, which will be next Thursday the 16th. And also I want to remind everyone to download the Fairplex app if you don't already have it. It will keep you up to date on all the fun things that are coming and even give you the option of reminders to pop up when your event is taking place to remind you to come and enjoy the activities. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Jamie. Next, Janet. Thank you. Okay, well, um, good 
Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm not really prepared. I didn't actually plan on speaking tonight, but I have a question for all of us. Um, what the heck is happening to our city? Like seriously, we've lived here 30 years. We came from England. My husband's American. And look, we came to Laverne because it was a safe, beautiful place to live. Our kids could ride their bikes on the streets. There wasn't trash on the ground. And I know it's, you know, a lot of cities this happens to, but um, I'm an owner in a, in a center, Wheeler and Foothill. There's been much talk about it. Now, when our family comes from England to visit us, they say, hey, take us to Route 66. You know, let's, they want to sing the song. We get our kicks on Route 66. And I'm like, guys, this is it. Sorry. This mess. And this just happened a couple of months ago. This five foot weeds, this trash, this mess. This is the historic Route 66. And it's very sad to me because I waited five years for my location. Now, in much discussion over it the last few weeks, I've done some of my own investigations. And I knew that that center was multiple owners. I knew that going in. What I didn't realize is the city has a whole list of uh, lists of violations and citations. And as far as I know, why, why haven't they been fined for the mess? And not just in my center, I'm talking about a, along the Foothill Corridor. Why have these corporate, you know, businesses a lot of them live out of town a lot of them live out of the country like we don't, i don't really care about them i don't care about one of the owners lives in china i care about the kid that's my neighborhood kid that can't ride his bike because there's homeless people living right there and there's trash everywhere you know and i live in laverne heights i don't know who lives there i got a note and this is not why i'm even speaking I got a note on my door saying, you know, we need to paint our garage. Like, shoot, I've been so busy, I didn't even realize there was a little bit of mess on my garage. It needed to be painted. I was given 10 days to paint my garage. We were happy to do it, because I'm like, well, shoot, this is our house prices, right? We want to make sure we're going to get maximum value on this house when we sell it. So my, three days later, my husband painted the garage, happy to do it. Answer my question, why has Baker Square looked so bad for 12 years? Why is there trash all over our streets? Like, there's so many youth that obviously have, don't have a lot to do because, you know, they may be causing trouble or out doing whatever. Can't we get some kind of a community thing to clean up our city? And the, the owners that live in China or that live in LA, I spoke to a lady today, Jill Artemis, who actually owns Crunch Gym, and she owns Dollar Tree. And I said, what can I do? She's in charge of the cleanup for the whole center, and then they have Max, who's in charge of everything. Now, last week, two weeks ago, I walked Max through the problem areas. There's sprinklers flying onto the road on Foothill in the middle of traffic. And I said, Max, that sprinkler, that sprinkler, that sprinkler. There's a big old pot, pothole right there. Janet, I got it. I, I'm going to do it. So today, to his big boss, Jill, I grasped him up. I said, Jill, when was the last time you walked through this, this area? And she said, oh, it's a year or two. And I said, well, guess what? It's in my face every single day. I see the weeds. I see the trash. So I'm sorry I'm giving you a bad day here, but I suggest you you and Max get together and figure it out. So the crazy thing, and I know now I'm on a roll, I'm talking about it. So she said, well, you know, they painted the lines in the parking lot. I'm like, great. Did he tell you he painted down and up again through the potholes without filling them in? So. When the car goes over the potholes, who cares there's a line there because your car's going to go all over the place anyway because an accident. So I said, do you know this? She had no clue. She said, well, I need to talk to Max. I said, well, I, told, I spoke to Max three weeks ago. He's done nothing. So council members, with due respect, 
And I know you guys probably all have your hearts in the right place. But the public will help you. But please cite them if they are not doing what they're supposed to do. These landlords are making big rents from us. My little building, $6,000 a month. That's a lot of haircuts. And I'm old. <laughs> but we've raised our kids. My oldest one's going to be 30 years old. And we're going to be working until we're probably 90, paying off the three kids in college. I don't want to move out of Laverne. Laverne embraced us. You guys are our family. Our family's in England. But I've lived here longer than I've lived in the UK. I don't want to move. But I don't want to live in crap. Sorry. That's it. Sorry. <laughs> Anybody else would like to speak at a public comment? Yeah. Go ahead. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Susie Morales. I live on Wheeler Avenue. By now, most of us know, uh, most of us are aware of the health concerns from the 5G small cell towers. And a lot of people are just learning about the health concerns. And I am here today, I am here today to ask the council if we can put a hold on this rollout until we have more information on how this will affect our community. Um, Congressman Peter DeFazio, 4th District, Oregon, um, wrote a letter to the FCC Chairman Ajit Pai requesting that the FCC and FDA to provide answers um, with the for the following questions. What scientific literature or research has the FCC and FDA used to determine that 5G technology will not cause adverse health effects in humans? <coughs> what gap exists in our current understanding of possible health effects from 5G technology as well as the possible health effects of radio frequency radiation? And what efforts has the federal government taken to educate, educate the public as well as state and local governments about its research on radio frequency radiation and safety guidelines as it relates to 5G technology. So until we hear back from the Fed, federal government and the studies are not funded by the telecom industry, um, we need our local government to create a strong ordinance so that the telecom carriers do not just come into our city and place the towers wherever they want. We need, we, I suggest that we can do some kind of meeting or Q&A and bring it back on the agenda so that the community has a chance to ask you guys questions. Um, we could bring extra communities back. We could bring an EMF um, expert and at least let's have some questions answered that we are all concerned and we need to know what's going to happen and we would like to keep it away from homes, schools, parks, where little kids are um, a lot and where they sleep, where they spend most of their time. And um, that's all I wanted to say today. Thank you very much. Oh, one more thing, I'm so sorry. I have a list of uh, people that, on net, uh, that I have been telling about this and um, they just wanted me to add their list because they couldn't add their name to a list because they couldn't make it to the meeting. Um, I'm, so I'm gonna pass that over to Lupe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chris. Good evening. Um, I'd just like to concur for the last uh, two speakers. Um, is it Janice? Yeah, Janice. Janet. Janet? Janet. Janet. <laughs> and, and Susie and I, I, I got to agree with both of them wholeheartedly. These are things that have been happening that we really need to look at and address. Um, I walk down to that shopping center all the time and it's, it's a mess. Um, and our, everyone knows our cell service sucks in Laverne. But we have to do the right thing too first. So, just wanted to say care on that. Um, I just wanted to, to let the community know uh, that this past uh, weekend was Firefighter Day. So, in case you didn't reach out to your Laverne firefighters and thank them for their service, I'm sure they still would like to hear from you. <clears throat> I'm sure that there must have been an oversight by the city. So I wanted to also let the, know, let the citizens know that within the fire department, the following promotions have currently happened. 
uh, Travis Moore to engineer, uh, Kevin Wilton to captain, uh, Kevin Greenway to battalion chief, and uh, also Captain Don Danny Montoya serving as interim uh, battalion chief. Um, as is with the tradition of the uh, Laverne Police <coughs> Department, I'm sure the city will be uh, planning a badge ceremony to honor these firefighters and uh, their proud families. So I'm sure that was just an oversight and it hasn't been uh, brought up or mentioned or put on the calendar yet, so hopefully it will happen real soon. Um, last thing I'd like to request that the city and the uh, city council can give uh, all the citizens an update on the status of Chief Jankowski and uh, Battalion Chief Thompson, since they're still on the payroll and very costly to the citizens. Uh, and we all know that we don't have it in the budget, so we certainly would like to know the status on that. And if somebody could put that on the agenda, please, so it could be addressed on when we're gonna stop paying those individuals and give us an update on that. And then I just want to <coughs> make uh, Lupe make sure that I'm on record in saying that I think that uh, Mr. Rosales, I think that your behavior towards Mrs. Kelly and Mr. Bowen tonight was not acceptable. It was not professional. <coughs> the same thing with you, Doc, Mr. Kendrick. I don't think that your behavior tonight was very acceptable for what I would expect. Thank you. fine city for 18 years. Um, he moved in in the 60s. So I do have a love for the city that goes back quite far. Um, I'm here to speak on 5G. Um, I took, uh, I did a little printing for all the council members and the city clerk, um, addressing um, that there's been a tremendous amount of um, research done that's not really being acknowledged. Um, and uh, this first report I have uh, refers to a, a study done since 1977, the Russians did on this technology. And it was in 2015 that the CIA declassified the document. Um, but there's been a tremendous amount of research done on what it, this technology does to the human body. Um, our s cell phones right now exist, but the towers, we hide them in palm trees, make them look cute, make them look like pine trees. They're above our head. But this process is going to put the refrigerator, not a pizza box, right on the ground. Um, and you made an investment in our light poles. And I understand we need money. Um, but to rent them out and get in on the technology, everybody's kind of going after the money first and then not really worrying about the health part, <coughs> excuse me, afterwards. So I just, I get it. The train is blowing through this country and around the world and saying 5G is what we need. But many, many, many countries and people around the world are questioning this. Um, have you ever thought about if you're at a stadium and there's like 40,000 people, you're at a big football game, and we get a phone call I mean, to our phone? Like, they, we know this technology is bouncing around. How do we get that phone call? Everybody could get a phone call at once and it would be our number. Um, but that's not the technology being used right now. We're going to be blanketed with this stuff. and. Um, there's a lot of people concerned about it. So as a city, I hope that you kind of think about the people. My niece just had a little baby. She's two and a half months old. Blanking people with this technology that there is research. We just don't want to look at it. Um, that's my concern. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Just a minute. Um, Linda's grandfather was a city manager uh, of this city, um, very um, they're great residents, personal friends of our families uh, for years and years and years. Um, he had a great grandfather and 
Harriet, your grandmother. Yes. And I think that niece is uh, probably Neil's grand. Uh, yes. Grandson or granddaughter. Great, great. Yes. Yeah. So tell them all hi for me. I will. Thank I you. Will. Thank you. Okay, yes, sir. This is like open mic Monday. Just right here. If you can just come up to the podium, please. Project Mike is on waiting for you. For you. How you doing? Big Tom. All right, I'm Nick Croce. I've um, been a resident of Laverne for, for a good 10 years. I've grown up here in the area, born in Glendora in 1959. Been around a long time, and um, well, 60 years now. The um, reason I'm here is because of 5G. Um, I'm concerned about it, and I'm wearing this eye patch. Okay? There's a reason for it. Um, a year ago, I had brain surgery. I had a benign meningioma. They pulled it out, but it also affected my eye. I have only half vision in my eye, and so this is how I have to read. And so why did I get this meningioma in the brain? And I believe it's because of radio frequency radiation. And we have a lot of it in our world. And so I feel like the poster child. Um, you know, I've been doing some research, and it's, it's not easy. You know, some people say there's been research, some that hasn't. The industry has one answer. The private industry has another an answer. But there are thousands of scientists who sound, who sounding the alarm. This is very, very dangerous stuff. It's not just your everyday radio frequency. It's tens to hundreds of times higher than what we're experiencing right now. But I understand this is something that it's like a train you can't stop. Obama was behind it, Trump's behind it, the industry's behind it, there's billions of dollars being invested in this. How can we stop it? I don't know, you know, but I just want to voice my opposition to it. I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm just being an alarmist, you know? But everything I've read about, heard about, looked into, there are thousands of scientists who are sounding the alarm and it's going to blanket everybody. It's going to hurt, they say, not just people, our pets, insects, bees, everything. Little girls growing up, it affects their ovaries. It's going to affect the next generation, the generation after that. Well, that solves the overpopulation problem. <laughs> so anyway, I also printed out something. If you'd like to take a look at it, you know, it's off the internet, so it's true. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Thank you, Dave. Anyway, you're very welcome. And I hope your operation was successful and you do well from now on. He was a wonderful surgeon. Let me tell you. Yeah. I'll just it. Pass it. A few of them. All right. Thank you, everybody. That's all I have. I'm sorry. Here we go. I can give you one of these. <laughs> okay, anybody else that would like to talk? Okay, I'm very well on the subject, might as well. Um, I uh, was looking at some stuff um, by uh, Dr. Deborah Davis, which is an internationally recognized expert on electromagnetic radiation from wireless transmitting devices. She has some pretty nice credentials. She's former senior advisor to the Assistant Secretary for Health in the Department of Health and Human Services, has counseled leading officials in the United States, United Nations, European Environment Agency, Pan American Health Organization, World Health Organization, and World Bank. Um, and I just took some notes of, of what she had to say. I thought it was really kind of eye-opening because there's just so much stuff out there just kind of really very clear to me. Uh, she said truth is a relative term. At one time, people believed that the world was flat. More than 6 billion cell phones are out now. More than 50 billion devices are anticipated to create the Internet of Things. Long ago, some of us remember, I think probably most of us, um, people could smoke on airplanes. People could smoke in restaurants. Uh, science at that time kind of had some questions, but we didn't really know um, whether there was a safety issue or not. <coughs> there are a lot of important questions to ask about wireless and radiation, and these days 
Not many are asking the legitimate, legitimate and important questions. Very little research is being done here in the US, uh, far less than in other countries. Um, but you know, back years ago, the idea of secondhand smoke didn't even exist. So we like calling people and getting messages on our phone. Um, if there's a problem, we would know about it, right? Well, she said, look at your cell phones, your iPhone particularly. You open it up, you look into settings, you go to general, about, and scroll way down to the bottom where it says legal, and it talks about RF exposure. So you can read that later, but you need to know that um, it tells you right on your iPhone that to reduce exposure, they suggest using hands-free headphones, speaker phones, etc., versus putting it right by your head. Uh, Wi-Fi devices, mobile devices emit pulsed microwave radiation. It's the pulse that appears to be biologically impactful. Pulsed and erratic for hours a day. 900 times a minute, a phone is looking for a signal and a tower. It goes to max power when it connects and rings, and you put it right here. Exposure affects people differently, just like the sun has different effects on people with different skin tones, different eye colors. So the same thing is true with the uh, radiation. Some people have more or less sensitivity. <coughs> A child absorbs proportionately more due to their small size. So where you stand depends on where you sit and who bought your chair. Sponsored research leads to published bias. Higher defined no effect. In the US, the gentleman directing the FCC, Tom Wheeler, was for 10 years the executive director of the CTIA, which is a Cellular T Telecommunications Industry Association. And now he's in charge of regulating those devices. It's challenging to have a neutral playing field. Every study shows we need more research. A lot of them do. It's called for, but never funded, <coughs> never acted upon. It's a matter of future health for our kids and grandkids. We have the right to know, and labeling is required. Many countries require headsets to be sold with phones. So, do we have to have the proof that there's significant risk before we take precautionary steps? Some schools are going back to wired computers versus Wi-Fi. Some countries are tearing towers down Belgium and Canada are advising consumers how to limit risks of radiation. The U.S. District Court had a ruling in 2014, and this is a quote from it. If there is a reasonable possibility that cell phone radiation is carcinogenic, the time for action in the public health and regulatory sectors is upon us. Even though the financial and social cost of restricting these devices would be significant. Those costs pale in comparison to the cost in human lives from doing nothing, only to discover 30 or 40 years from now that the early signs were pointing in the right direction. If the probability of carcinogenicity is low, but the magnitude of the potential harm is high, good public policy dictates that the risk should not be ignored. There's major risk of future studies showing a link, and that would result in litigation and damages. So let's slow down and get some independent, re independent research. Um, council, um, don't depend solely on what's in packets before voting on things. Enlarge your sources of information. Do some research on your own. Uh, we don't want to become a cookie cutter town just because all of the San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments is doing some things a certain way. We can be different, we can be safe. And um, I really oppose it, especially since it's going to go probably about every 200 to 300 feet in order to get proper coverage. And that's, there's no way you can avoid it. Thank you, ma'am. Anybody else would like to speak at a public comment? Hi, my name is Lee. 
I'm Yi Huang, living on 7th Street in Laverne. I just want to follow up the last two meetings, a protest of white avenue widening. Um, at the beginning, I think I was just a volunteer. Uh, but after that two meetings, we collect like a 55 uh, petition signature here. And then uh, we collect from the neighbor uh, up to almost like 250. We don't really clear. It's on my hand. Just my personal is uh, close to like 130 here. So that means not 130 residents. It's like a household. One people side is like a so whole family uh, just really opposed uh, white avenue. So what I know about it though, hmm, that night is the white walking. Okay, uh, so I went there, I talked to people. A lot of people, they not really live in uh, the room. They just come walk here and then they just come, just love this city. When we mention uh, this topic, because we have the phone on the uh, salon, and then people just like, I would say 90, 95% people say, why they have to do widening? So people sign and then it's, uh, especially people leave the resident sign. Most people, they're not here, they're not signed. They just tell us they really want to keep Laverne just like a small town because I think the small town is charming and priceless, not because for convenience. So especially uh, even this morning, 5.30, some people like said, could I drop that by your house a side, side uh, petition? 5.30 in the morning. And then he goes, I, I would drove on White Avenue every single day and go to Mentor Link. They just don't have to do that. So I have to sign it. So he come this morning, 5.30, and some people come to my house this morning because I say today will be the deadline. We have to do everything by five o'clock. And still have some people ask me sign tonight. They say, they say it's not final, right? This meeting is really, really big July. I say, yeah, maybe. I think if we really doesn't want it, we should do something. So I still have people keep signing tonight. And uh, I post on the internet, I, I'm, I'm a designer. I just put all the picture together and make a video call. If you like the room, uh, please don't be silent. Well, I put two songs, Scarborough Fair and The Sound of Silence. That's my favorite song. Because I first time know the city because from that movie, The Graduate. My husband told me that, you know what? My two kids grow up in the two preschool. They say, you don't know this church? They say, familiar? Yeah. So what is that? They say, that movie. OK, that's that. We really love this town. So when I put this two song, you know what, I, I was so per surprised. They said, yeah, that's Laverne. I said, yeah, the, the, the movie make this from Laverne. Okay, so that's the price list of the small charming town. So my personal, I really oppose, I don't really like the idea, just like a widening, two lane to four lane, and then maybe just temperate, because just like the mayor last time said, because uh, we need to uh, help the traffic, uh, because the Laverne station will uh, build up earlier, and then later, two years later, maybe close that two years, Kalima and Pomona, the station, Go Light station, they have that. So maybe not that much traffic. Think about the people that car drive at night, just like a racing car. Think about four lane. Oh my God, such a great racing place. How dare my kids cross that street? Go to, I live in 7th Street, all his friends live on the other side of the 3rd Street. They cross every single day. Unfortunately, his friend broke his arm last, last week. It made me feel so scary because of the safety issue. So I talked to so many uh, parents that people look, uh, walk there. I know it's very important for us. It's not final. Even you guys say, hey, we send all those send to go, go in or send to environment department. But we, we work for you guys, right? So you guys really need to speak for our residents. Because uh, we, we feel so helpless. Because I saw the lady, uh, Sue. She had the side, oh my gosh, because it's put there, it's so windy. Keep dropping. Want to, want, to, want to see her? She said, oh, Lee, please, okay, I have help you. Do, do this. I said, it's okay, I post on internet, everybody know it. And then she still very much, she's an old lady, you know. I feel just, I said, I'm fine. And then she, Lee, I so appreciate it. What's your size t-shirt? I want to give you a t-shirt. I said, I'm fine, I'm fine. I just want to help, okay. So that's the, so touching, you know what I mean? We live just like a family. I live here 13 years. I already have my, ha my home. Okay, so I just really want uh, everybody to know um, uh, we are just, Laverne is a big family. Okay, we love you. We're not going anywhere. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Good evening, staff, city council, mayor, uh, Jim Murphy, Raymond Drive. 
So Pam, thanks for everything on 5G and those that spoke on 5G tonight. I think it's something worthy that the city should look into. Didn't really think about it until tonight. I also agree with Pam that truth is a relative term. And tonight we've heard a lot of stretches. So I want to bring some truth back to the city council meeting tonight. First of all, Mr. Bowen, it was a quarter percent sales tax that we looked at. Before the, yeah, you said 1%, Rick. <clears throat> the microphone is doing thing, it works in here. Before the uh, comment was, was actually brought to the agenda that night, the city council had pulled it because of two subsequent measures that passed and gave the, uh, gave the uh, city additional funding. So that sets that record straight. Mr. Hepburn, you talked tonight about the cost of our insurance to the JPA. I might want to remind you that uh, it was brought up at one of the council meetings that the reason for our insurance going up was because of the comment you made about the fire chief. That is fact. It is on record. And that is the reason why they almost dropped the city of Laverne from their insurance coverage. So when we start to talk about insurance costs going up, we understand that as residents, but you don't need to help it. Then I want to remind you that uh, not only that night we talked about the fire chief, but in subsequent uh, council meetings, we talked about uh, Battalion Chief Thompson. I think in the, in the uh, country that we live in, it's guilty until proven innocent. Uh, excuse me, innocent until, I got that backwards. <laughs> Thank you. All right. You can make that correction, Lupe. It's innocent until proven guilty. And yet, uh, B.C. Thompson had, didn't, wasn't afforded that until the, uh, until the trial, but yet in this council meeting, based on some comments you made, that was the verdict before the verdict was actually handed down. And tonight, we heard you go after the city manager and the city attorney. And sometimes I wonder, when you look around your colleagues here, do you ever wonder why it's four to one? Does that ever strike? I mean... We all got to work together. The residents behind me, this half of the room, I know where they stand. I'm not sure the other half, but I know the one thing that we all do want, we want this city to come back together. This is divisive. It's not helping. And then I think Mr. Rosales makes some fine comments tonight, <clears throat> but when the crowd doesn't appreciate his, his comments and they, 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 they dissent from what he's saying, and all of a sudden, he asked them to, to, to quiet down. It's, it's written right here. we got rules of engagement now in the city of Laverne. But when they don't adhere to it, and he mentions something, now we got a double standard that, that Fred calls out. It just gets worse and worse every council meeting. And it did start two years ago. So look at the timeline. All right? The real reason I stood up tonight to talk was, these are just some things from tonight's meeting, but I stood up here tonight to talk about something that I will agree with Fred on, and that was 18 to 24 months ago, we endured this lawsuit, not from the firefighters, but from their union. And I'll repeat that over and over and over again, because this was a union action. This wasn't individual firefighters coming out here to make more money, to get a better deal. This was their union leading them down the bad path that they did the same thing in Downey, Manhattan Beach, and West Covina. Those are all public records. You can look them up. I'm not stretching anything. It is there. The unions went after these cities like they did in Laverne. Unfortunately, in Downey, it cost them $3.7 million. Here, it cost us $5.5. We didn't see the writing on the wall. I've been speaking about this for two years. But yes, I'm one voice in the, in the audience. Now it's come to bear. The city's down $5.5 million. And we want to talk about a 1% sales tax. We want to talk about spending seventy five grand to figure this whole thing out. I want to talk about what's the next lawsuit. Everybody behind me wants to know what happened to this lawsuit. And that's really why I stood up here tonight. Because I think it's time for, for the city council, city manager, the city attorney to give us the other side of this argument. We have heard for the last 18 to 24 months from the union. We've actually heard from some of the firefighters. We've heard from the, the, the union's legal counsel who stood in here several times and address the city council. But yet we've never heard from you, and I think it's high time we did. And Mr. Russi, I'm, I'm sure that comes you know, through you because you're, you're the, our city manager. Um, we need to hear what the other side of that was. We understand when Mr. Kress said, we under legal, um, under legal counsel ad advice, we can't speak right now. But yet we saw everybody I just mentioned get up in council meetings, town halls, 
Heck, they even got on social media and were so vicious about what was going on in the city. If you decided, like several people did before the decision was rendered, if you decided by what you read in social media, this thing should have been settled 23 months ago. So we need to hear from you. We need to understand what actually happened. Again, once again, I will agree with Fred. We want to know what's going on with Chief Jankowski, Battalion Chief Thompson. I think we should be afforded that. It's our city. This was a personnel issue. Hell, we heard about a firefighter who lost a day's vacation. That's, if that personnel issue makes it here, let's talk about the chief. Let's talk about Battalion Chief, or Battalion chief Thompson. Let's find out what really happened in that lawsuit. I think we're afforded that opportunity. I think we should be afforded that opportunity. Um, and lastly, I just want to say the comments made tonight uh, by Council Member Rosales, Mayor Kendrick, you have every right to your opinion, as these guys do out here, and I'm glad once in a while it gets voiced. Tim, you had your chance to say what you had to say tonight, too. So I don't understand why that can be said when most of it was borderline factual, as, as pointed out by Mr. Rosales, and yet when somebody else says something and the audience reacts, it's a double standard. Shouldn't happen in the city. I'm happy to live here. I don't need a realtor, I'll be, I'm, I'm going to stay here. So you might want to take that care of that lady that left earlier, though. She might have a house for sale. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. That's it. Well, it's nice to follow Mr. Murphy for a change. Um, one fact I believe that he left out was um, that he, and I believe it's in the minutes, that he said the city will prevail in the lawsuit. They want their day in court and they have a great chance of prevailing. Well, that was five and a half million dollars ago. Um, I just want to say something real quick. Mayor, known you a long time. I like you as a person. Um, as we've said before, our daughters grew up together. I, if I misspoke tonight and said 1%, I, I know in fact it was a quarter percent. So if I misspoke, sorry about that. But saying I wanted to be in charge, really? Um, I guess I, I I've got it on an email. I would love to see where I wanted to be in charge. Okay. Um, because it never came to that, number one. And Mr. Rosales, again, I've known you for many years, played golf. Um, I consider you a good man. But your actions, um, when it comes to some of these people, and, and me included, um, seems to be very personal. And I've never made this personal. It's all about city process, city business, and what goes on. And I don't know why it's personal, but uh, I'm, I'm not, I should be pissed, but I'm just sad. Anybody else like to address the council? Anna. Change the subject. Please. I wanted to, I want to talk about progress. Um, I know that the, um, the city can't do anything about California laws that are coming up and the insanity that is going on in California. But I want to talk about a lot of things like um, the white, white new white street, um, the people who in that center have to put up with 10 landlords and they have different parcels and, and they can't get anything done. I know we have, to, we have to go with progress and things are going to change. But if progress is going to change the quality of life in our city, if it's going to change the harmony of living here, and if it's going to change the ability for people to be able to speak for their own community, then that's not progress. And I know this thing with white you really have no control over, and people would like you to stand up with them. And um, I would like to see the mission that we have in Laverne, that's our statement of what our mission is, follow for years and years and years. A charming city that has an old town, town feel. And I just ask you that whatever you can do to keep that going, 
or if you can give us advice on how to get around some of these things that the, that the uh, California is just enforcing on the cities to do, then I'd like to hear it. I mean, if there's something we can do as a community to stop some of the stuff from happening. Um, like I heard that these apartments on First Street, you're gonna have to have some kind of, um, what's it called? Well, some kind of ratio for the people who to, is it low income people? Yeah, that's, that, I think that's a California law, right? Yes. That's a California law. But, and then at the last meeting, when I had to hear, to hear about life, people were talking about, you know, I might just rent my house out. You know, that starts changing the dynamics of the city. It starts changing the demographics of the city. I know two of you live down there. You know what it's like to live in an area that's all rented? that people you know, really don't care about their homes anymore, they're just renting. That just changes the de demographics and a lot of the stuff's changing the demographics are, of our city. Um, having to deal with the homeless situation, having the gold line coming in, having the gold line telling us that you know, we're gonna have to widen the street instead of figuring out something else. It's getting to be, um, it's getting to be challenging for everybody, not just the people living here and I'm sure it's challenging for you too to have to deal with this stuff. I don't like the San Gabriel City, is it San Gabriel City Council, what is it, the Council of Cities? I don't like it and the reason I don't like it is because they have an agenda. I don't know if you know it, I don't know if you buy their propaganda, but they have an agenda and it seems like all the cities involved are all doing the same thing. And I'll tell, give you one example. You were talking about widening, widening White Street and then talking about the bike lanes that are going to go in. Why would you put bike lanes in and take up more of that property if it had to be done? Bike, biking is a, an activity, great activity, but it's not a necessity. Cars are a necessity. People have to go to work. People have to drop their kids off at work. They're not going to be riding bikes to do that. That's a, that's a propaganda put out by the, it's an agenda. I have nothing against people riding bikes. I ride bikes, I have a lot of bikes, okay? But to do something like that, to take more room off a street like that is ridiculous. See, see, little things like that bother me. I would like the city council to make their own minds up about what happens in our city. Not what the San Gabriel Council of Cities say, but what happens in our own city because we have to keep our city like we want it. We don't want to be like Glendora. We don't want to be like Rancho. And then I have to, I have to hear from people that, oh, or our demographics are bad. That's why we can't have the things that Claremont has. That's not true. Claremont's not that much higher in our, you know, the demographics as far as the income and, and age, medium age. It's just that Claremont complains more. I know Claremont, I worked in Claremont, but believe me, those people complain and they get what they want. You never, I mean, we've got a lot of people at the city council members now, at our, our, at our council members now, but it never used to be like this. So yeah, people are complaining more, but that's good because that's, instead of people just moaning at their homes and saying, okay, I don't like this, I don't like that, they're here, here talking about it, okay? And we have, to, we have to all listen to them. We all have to voice our opinions. And I hope the city council, I know you can't do it all the time. I know there's laws. But I hope you always go with, with the people, not with the San Gabriel City of, I can't even say what it is. It's too long. Council of Governments. Council of Governments once. You know, we have, to, we have to be, we have to listen to the people and what they want because the people have to come first in the city. And if they don't, they're gonna move, and then things, it's gonna change here. Because I think most people in the city think alike, for the most part. They might have their differences here, but you know how they wanna live, they think alike. That's why we get along here, as far as neighbors. And there's different opinions, and there's fighting, but you know, that's just part of life. Not everybody's gonna agree. You all know that, right? Not everybody's gonna agree. That's just it. And you own a business, you own a business, and you know that when you're dealing with people, they're all different. So 
They're all different. And you just gotta handle the person in front of you. We don't need really all this upset. Thanks, Anna. Okay. Anybody else would like to uh, address the city council? Okay, we will move on to item eight, council comments, conference, and reports. Jenny, you want to start? Sure. Um, yeah, I just, the wine walk this Saturday, I don't know if anybody went, but it was pretty successful. I mean, our staff, uh, I know Eric sure was there watching the wine pours, making sure that they weren't past the line on the cup. Boom. <laughs> and Darlene Boy was setting it up. But uh, I went through, I think, every single shop, including Mr. Kendricks, and uh, everybody had a great time. It was just a great, great, great day. A um, couple items. Uh, May is bike month for the Laverne Bike Coalition. They're having a bike ride uh, on May 11th at 9 a.m. at Mita Coons Park, corner of Benita Magnolia. To bike to some of the areas that most people don't know about in Laverne. Uh, Thursday, May 16th, um, Laverne Bicycle, uh, with the University of Laverne, the Laverne Bicycle Coalition, um, they'll have a pit stop on the bike way to work over there. I guess they're gonna, are they gonna do the gotcha bikes? Looks like this, we have a, gotcha bikes is gonna be, it's a pedal assist, uh, electric assist bike that we're gonna be, how many are we gonna have? Not sure yet. Anyway, we're gonna be getting some of those in our community, so that'll be coming soon. You'll all be hearing about that. That's uh, for the Laverne Bike Coalition. Hometown Heroes is Wednesday. Um, business community and the citizen of Lawrence San Dimas join together to honor and recognize first responders. Uh, it'll be the first one at uh, um, Hillcrest Homes. And um, <coughs> that'll be Wednesday, five o'clock. You can go online, Hometown Heroes. If you still wanna purchase tickets, I think there's still some available. Uh, May 20th is the uh, Laverne Police Officers Association's first annual charity golf tournament. You can go online for that also. I'm sure there's still some availabilities here, but uh, it's filling up fast. Uh, two weeks ago, the second Friday ago, they had the Ed Jones Golf Tournament, and I talked to uh, Ann Sparks and Alta, Alta Brown, and they made like $25,000 on the tournament. So for educational foundations, that's pretty darn good. So, thank you. Yeah. Right. I too attended the wine walk. It was a great success. We made a lot of money. I met people from Riverside, San Bernardino, Orange County, different cities. They came to our downtown area, thoroughly enjoyed, shopped that they didn't even know were here. Um, it, it was really <coughs> a, a well attended event by people that were enjoying alcoholic beverages. But, but really conducted themselves in a way that was exemplary. And I, as a police officer for 31 years, I, I truly appreciated the fact that everyone obeyed the law and, and acted appropriately in front of them. Um, I had the opportunity this last week to visit the police department in two different briefings at six in the morning and six in the evening uh, on two different occasions, on, on a Monday and on, <coughs> correction, on a Tuesday, and on a, on a Thursday. I, I can tell you, we don't have enough police officers. They, they went out of this briefing answering calls. And I can tell you that the handwriting's on the wall. If, if you're backed up calls waiting to be answered, <coughs> you have an issue with response times. And we can't start having those kinds of issues in the face of what's happening in Sacramento. We really have to so be ahead of the Collect the citation from everybody. Collect. <laughs> collect. <laughs> you collected everything that's owing? <laughs> Please just understand that the law enforcement, the fire department are the backbone of this city. Public safety is the number one issue. We all campaigned on that issue. So please understand that that's that's vitally important to us. And uh, this coming Sunday is Mother's Day. For those of you that are celebrating, happy Mother's Day. You're Mr. John. So last Monday, we had a gold line study session here. It was well attended. Um, I think there were a lot of good comments. Uh, I appreciated what I heard. 
and it is, continues to inspire me to think creatively. I hope that folks show up at the Gold Line Board in July for that meeting. I'll be there. I will be, um, or I, I drove through the Wine Walk this last Saturday, taking my daughter around on her little social events. Um, no, the traffic was working well. I mean, the people were staying on the sidewalks and the cars were able to get through. I've been on my bicycle, except my daughter doesn't bicycle that far. I will be bicycling on May 16 to the office 12 miles away. So thank you for showing up, everybody. We start off with 5G. And Susan, thank you for bringing it to our attention. Um, we are taking it seriously. We're doing research. We want to bring it back so that um, probably in a study session where everybody can um, come in and talk about it. So thank you very much for bringing it to light and everybody else for starting to do some research on this. Um, we are thinking about it seriously, so thank you. Um, somebody brought up the, um, <coughs> the light poles, uh, renting out the light poles to Made cell towers. That was not the object of getting those uh, light towers. Uh, those were purchased for medicine. There's approximately 1,900 of them that were. They have been retrofitted with LED lighting, and it's going to save the city approximately $170,000 a year. So we get better light, and we don't have to spend as much money. So that was the purpose of that. This the mini cell towers came later, but was not the reason we were doing it. Um, Thank you, Lee, for continuing to talk about the widening of White Avenue. That is a serious issue, and um, uh, I live down there. I know Muir lives down there. A lot of friends of mine uh, that have for decades lived down there. So this is not take. This is not being taken lightly. So thank you. Uh, one question: How? Can uh, you not just a minute. You. It's our turn to get to talk. Um, one of the things that um, Charlie uh, talked about was the safety and so forth. And Janet, I know you talked about it. And that is, um, we, we have been hit with something very serious, and that's AB 109, mm -hmm. which is the re early release of criminals. Um, Prop 47, which is the uh, changing of felonies to misdemeanors so they don't even go to, to jail. And then Prop 57, which is another release of not violent criminals, and if I read you the list of the crimes, as Janet has heard, it's, it's appalling. But that's put out about 100,000 people onto our streets. And so we need to act differently. This is our town. We need to be different. Um, there are ways to be safe. Um, the first presentation I made of what I call a burnt cop talk um, with a police officer was at your business, and thank you for allowing us to come in. Um, but it is something we, we need to be proactive about, about this community. We need to be able to dial 911 whenever <coughs> you see something, um, say something, and that means dial 911. So please, please um, be part of the solution, and um, we will continue to, to make this um, city as safe as we can. And two people sitting back in the corner is our leadership and our police department, our chief and our captain, they're doing everything they can to make this the safest community for each and every one of us. Um, and thank you, thank you for that. A little bit about the wine walk. I appreciate Tim and Charlie coming in. I this has been going, I think, about seven years, and we have uh, been one of the wine pours um, for every um, every year but one. I didn't see Eric coming in uh, complaining about the size of the pores, but there's a line of the wine glass, and you're supposed no to think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was a fabulous night. There's 13 tickets sold. The money, there's two um, opportunities for the profits of that. One, it's $5,000 goes to a charity within the city, uh, and the rest of it goes to the bus downtown business improvement district and the new lights that you see down there, and the, and the lights around the trees, and the promotion activities for the downtown, which all comes back in additional sales tax revenue, which helps to pay for our services. It's all about what's going on down there. So it's a vibrant, vibrant uh, downtown that we're very proud of. So, um, for those that went to the Wine Walk, appreciate it. It's usually at this time of year, every year, so <laughs> look for 
uh, this event next year there will be a sip of Laverne which is a beer walk toward the end of September so um, put that on your calendar as well uh, we will be adjourning to May 20th at 5 o'clock we will have a study session on extension of the waste management and refuse contract and our regular scheduled meeting will be at 6 30 in these chambers really appreciate everybody coming not everybody agrees on everything but discussions and opening people's eyes and learning new things is the way we're going to make this community the best that we can so thank you for being here